Welcome everyone. My name is Mark McCaffrey and I'm really excited to have you all with us today. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here as participants uh, and to Benjamin Sovacool, Matt Huber and uh, Zandra Kovish, our facilitator. Uh, we are looking forward to a uh, discussion slash debate uh, slash conversation uh, about uh, what we're titling Green Anarchy and Eco-Socialism. And uh, I'll just give you a few sort of brief introductory comments before we uh, turn it over to Zandra, our facilitator. Uh, but uh, just a sort of very brief history of uh, human history. We have a lot of uh, examples of past societal collapse that we can read from history and of course science fiction and uh, zombie apocalypse movies are looking at future collapse of society. Uh, but uh, the prospect of human extinction and, and the end game, if you will, is something that by and large, I think we try to avoid contemplating. Uh, and, and yet uh, it, it is a distinct possibility uh, according to uh, a lot of scientists. And, and I think a lot of us wonder about the, the future of the human race uh, I've been reading some interesting research recently about how human beings almost did not make it through uh, to this point because uh, 42,000 years ago, there was a, a geomagnetic uh, event. Some of you may have seen this paper in the journal Science. Uh, it's titled A Global Environmental Crisis 42,000 Years Ago. And it talks about uh, a geomagnetic reversal, which uh, flipped the, not, it didn't entirely flip, but these polar, the magnetic poles started to reverse. And it's a process that lasted nearly a thousand years. And according to the authors, it uh, disrupted the climate, uh, thinned the ozone layer and caused uh, a lot of environmental uh, uh, problems, which, uh, caused the extinction of the, and the Neanderthals, according to the uh, authors of the paper. And just to keep in mind that at that point, 42,000 years ago, uh, which is not that many generations ago, if, if you figure like maybe, maybe four generations, four or five generations a century, uh, that there was uh, only about a, hundred, a, a million Homo sapiens on the planet. And if we, uh, look at what they were up to during those during that period we find that there were uh, they were really into red ochre uh, and they were using red ochre as a way of making handprints and uh, find these handprints at, uh, at that time period of 42,000 years ago in places like Spain in uh, Indonesia and in Australia and if we f fast forward 30,000 years to the end of the ice age uh, when there were maybe 5 million people on the planet, we still see red ochre being very popularly used. Uh, uh, th these are from a cave in South America, which uh, Homo sapiens had, had made it to about 10,000 years ago. Uh, so there's one theory that uh, the red ochre was being used as a, a, a uh, sunblock during that period. Uh, and there were mines that date back about 40,000 years to, in Africa for, for red ochre. So that was the, the mineral of the time that was very uh, popular for, for possibly a sunblock, but also for uh, stenciling our hands and, and uh, other ceremonial efforts. So, you know, the, these red hands stenciled with red ochre are a very kind of striking human signature uh, you, you know, in a way, it's sort of saying, look, here I am, hello. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe it's a helping hand, maybe it's waving for help. But uh, in the past uh, 10,000 years, since uh, the end of the last ice age, uh, the, the so-called Holocene period, uh, we've been, we as human homo sapiens have been very good at building things, uh, houses, pyramids, and bridges. And more recently, a lot of uh, electronic uh, systems. And uh, we've also invented all sorts of structures uh, and systems that are not existing physically, but uh, we, we, you know, we've invented governments, religions, uh, companies and corporations that 
exist in our minds or on paper, but uh, uh, they're uh, phenomena that are largely human inventions. Uh, and uh, we've invented a lot of isms, uh, in, including two that we'll be discussing today, uh, green anarchism and eco-socialism. Now, some of you may be well immersed in, the, in these topics, uh, and uh, we're, we, we're, you may be aware that there's a lot of uh, history and there's also some, uh, so, some f frustration between the, these two camps. Uh, and uh, you may be uh, really well aware of these uh, differences between the eco-socialists and what we're calling the green anarchists. But uh, I suspect that many of you are like me, you're relatively new to these topics. And uh, so you may be in a learning curve, you may be, uh, uh, you know, maybe you're required to be here by a professor, but in any event, uh, we welcome you very warmly and ask you to in introduce yourself in the chat window if you'd like, and also to uh, pose your questions and comments, and we'll do our level best to uh, weave those comments and questions in uh, to the discussion later in, in the event. So a, a very brief uh, clarification about scale. Uh, a few years ago, some friends and I were frustrated by the fact that uh, we often talk about scale in very vague terms. We talk about uh, national scale, even though countries may be on the order of a billion people or more or down to a few hundred thousand people. Uh, and uh, we talk about communities as if we all, all have a clear idea of what communities mean. Uh, so uh, we uh, started talking about the fact that there's 10 orders of magnitude between a single individual and uh, all the people on the planet. And we developed what we call the powers of 10 framework which uh, I know it's gonna be impossible for you to read here, but uh, I'll post a link into the chat window later if any of you are interested in this framework. Uh, one thing that we used uh, the powers of 10 framework was uh, as a tool to look at different scales where we might be able to uh, deploy different uh, interventions to reduce carbon emissions and to uh, support regeneration at different scales. And what we found, we looked at over 70 different interventions and we found that there was kind of a sweet spot at um, a scale of between what we call the community scale of 10,000 people to the urban scale of a million people. And that's the scale where the greatest number of interventions can be deployed. And it's also where the greatest benefit, both in terms of uh, benefit to people and to uh, economic benefits, potential economic benefits could be uh, derived uh, and uh, particularly at the community scale of about 10,000 people. So one of the hopes that I have of this discussion today is that we can explore a little bit about the different perspectives of scaling between the uh, what we're calling the green anarchists and uh, the eco-socialists, we, as I say, we acknowledge that uh, these labels are in, in many ways flawed, uh, that uh, many of you may be immersed in uh, anarchism or socialism for many, many years or decades. Uh, and uh, perhaps in the comments section and the Q&A section, you'll be able to give your perspective on uh, these uh, issues. but. If you're new, if you're learning about these topics like I am, uh, please, uh, uh, please feel free to share your thoughts. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our facilitator, uh, Zonda Kovish from Corvinus University, who among other things is the host of the podcast, Economics for Radicals. And uh, over to you, Zandra. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you very much for um, initiating this debate. Um, and um, uh, it's actually economics for rebels. So if any of you would like to listen to the podcast, it's economics for rebels, um, although radicals is quite, quite a nice one as well. Um, but um, now that 
the, the way we will proceed, we will have Benjamin uh, give us uh, his thoughts um, roughly for about 10 minutes. And then we'll have Matt uh, also giving us um, his, his opening statement. Um, then I'll have some time to, um, to maybe contest these ideas or, or um, um, have a few thoughts on them. Uh, and after some rebuttals, we will open the floor to you. Um, so um, I'm passing the floor to, to Benjamin. Um, please um, share your thoughts on um, uh, green anarchism with us. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And I've just made you host so you can keep letting people in <laughs> because they keep coming and I can't do that as I am presenting. So good to see everyone. I've been reading the chats. We actually have lots of political economists, green anarchists, and people who study power and gender and anti-racism and feminism. So it's a bit uh, intimidating to be presenting uh, in front of such a good group because I do not identify personally as an eco-anarchist. I'm wearing a collar. Uh, and have a white collar job probably, so I'm not often in the streets. But I did at least want to summarize some of the kind of perspectives behind these approaches. And so I've titled this very brief talk, it's only 10 minutes, Beyond Technology Policy and Behavior, Direct Action Tactics for Transformative Change. And the reason I've done that is because my own thinking and lots of the thinking of my colleagues, some of which are here from the University of Sussex, does tend to obsess over innovation. So we do all this amazing work on certain technologies, heat pumps, solar panels, wind turbines, uh, or even people like Adrian Smith who are doing digital fabrication, three-dimensional printing, new vaccines, pharmaceuticals, genetically modified crops. And in a lot of the carbon neutral pathways that groups like the International Energy Agency do, technology features centrally, right? This was taken just a few weeks ago, and this shows you the key technologies in the net zero roadmap. It's wind and solar photovoltaics and battery electric vehicles and improvements in energy efficiency. And the innovation dynamics are amazing, whether it's creative destruction or innovation systems or three frames of innovation or the multi-level perspective. There are whole sets of heuristics that talk about technology. And more recently, especially for those of you that have been following the IPCC and kind of net zero reports, there's also a role for behavior, which up until the past 10 years hasn't really been treated in the same way as supply. But there are demand side innovations that have us change how we heat and cool and do laundry and drive or eat meat or ride share or give up aviation, which can also achieve very significant reductions in CO2. And there's a whole series of work in behavioral science and applied economics about nudging, boosting, constraining, norms, social influence, uh, as well as interesting frameworks like Asgen's theory of planned behavior or Schwartz's norm activation model, which are all behavioral centered. And finally, because I still have a role at SPRU, and that stands for Science Policy Research Unit, we obsess over policy, right? The policy architectures and mixes and tools and incentives that can stimulate or constrain low carbon innovations. And there's even a framework that we applied called the NATO framework that talks about uh, not the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but nodality, authority, treasure, and organizations, three types of policy mechanisms. And you can see different famous policy mechanisms like carbon taxes or feed-in tariffs or RPSs or R&D hubs that sit across these different typologies. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are more than 100 different policy mechanisms that can promote climate action. So it already seems like we've got enough to talk about. Technology, almost ad infinitum, behavior, with so many things we can do, and changing policy. And yet, most of us would agree, despite these three different types of interventions, we are woefully off track to decarbonize. We are entering an era of mass extinction, which is even called the Necrocene. So we're moving from the Anthropocene to the Necrocene. Um, and we are not on target for a 1.5 degree world. And the IPCC is telling us most likely two to three degrees. And that's if we don't anticipate tipping points. So this leads me very provocatively to ask, are there other things that we can do beyond innovating technology, changing our consumption, and promoting policy, and there are. And I teamed up with Alexander Dunlap, who I think may be here, 
to kind of summarize three very different literatures that talk about how we can transform social systems that aren't necessarily dependent on innovation behavior or policy intervention. We have the kind of school of thought on civil disobedience, which talks about things like Thoreau and others who are protesting and taking direct action by mass arrests and hunger strikes and trespassing and hacktivism. We have a whole set of work in neo-Marxism and anarchism that talks about anti-authoritarian strategies like witnessing and watching or delegitimizing certain potential actions or sabotage or even permanent resistance. And finally, we have a whole school of military history, basically an insurgency and military action and guerrilla warfare, drawing from Marxist-Leninism or security studies or Maoism uh, that talks about extremely radical actions like bombing or assassination or paramilitary action. All of these approaches and different schools have these different groundings, different foci, different tactics, but they all also have a degree of anarchy in them. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that at the most basic level to generalize at a very abstract school of thought, anarchy is a dismissal of authority and control. What separates anarchist thinking from other approaches is usually an inherent rejection of hierarchy, centralization, and authority, especially those that create groups of people, elite, non-elite, policymaker, non-policymaker, uh, or that divide labor, CEOs and corporate leaders versus precarious workers, or that subvert people to the forces of capital and capitalism. This actually creates different epistemic intersections, right? Because it tries to recognize at the level of knowledge production that actually states and governments don't exist, right? The state is not like a lamppost. You can't touch it. It is a construction in our mind. Same with borders and sovereignty. And these are co-constructed actively by all of us and our patterns of voting, our patterns of citizenship. And this often reinforces prejudice and its various drivers like patriarchy and sexism and racism. And it also patently destroys the environment. So there's an epistemic flavor to anarchism. There is an analytical flavor to anarchism as well, which suggests that, well, the solution isn't to transform the system per se. It might be to reject it entirely, burn it to the ground, begin again with new forms of socialist relations that are not so much focused on either hypercapitalism or modern forms of what Foucault would call governmentality. And finally, there's an intersectional dimension that kind of recognizes hegemony and its totality and how these different sub-features, economic relations, political organization, psychological norms, ideological propaganda, and military violence all combine together. They intersect to create total oppression, which then requires total decolonization of these systems of domination. So. I think that pragmatically, green anarchism, anarchism or ecological anarchism places environmental issues at its core, just like political ecology replaces political economy. And this then opens up the discussion space for things like the defense of land, the liberation of animals, and the appreciation of new forms of knowledge, especially among indigenous cultures and people. So I'm using the term, and Alex and I are using the term anarchy as a broad umbrella that captures these very diverse perspectives within them. And doing so definitely brings to light very new actions for climate, some of which, as you can see here, are covert and clandestine, hidden, some of which are overt. And there's even a kind of theory in social movements that you move from clandestine actions to overt actions and you move from violent actions to nonviolent actions, kind of moving up of the ladder. And any of you that have read Kim Stanley Robinson's recent book, Ministry for the Future, will see some of these, like assassinations, like the bombing of yachts and the downing of aircraft with drones, as a way to catalyze rapid action for climate. Um, and the argument being that in the long run, the deaths of individuals are justified by the saving of thousands of more individuals or entire ecosystems and the climate. It also gets you a new inventory of tactics. Right, where you have all of these things suggested by those three literatures, civil disobedience, anarchism, guerrilla warfare, and insurgency, uh, including bank robbery and sabotage and hunger strikes and boycotts and uh, delegitimization and witnessing and watching. 
So to conclude, and this is my last slide before I pass it over to, to Matt, these types of approaches do point the way towards leverage points and repertoires of action that are beyond the traditional notions of technology and behavior and policy. And many of the tactics that we mention are actually featured in multiple literatures. So they exist not only in the anarchy literature, they also exist in the history literature and the security studies literature. So I call this triangulation, right? There's proof and evidence that these types of tactics have worked before multiple times in multiple places. When we think about these actions, there is a distinction that's made about acceptable and unacceptable acts, as well as the role of violence. And this is very murky territory. Um, Martin Luther King was also known as strategically using violence, not himself, but using peaceful demonstrations to provoke violence that then made his opponents look unreasonable. Uh, and so there's also been work on 100 years of social movements in the US that found that violent social movements achieve their goals faster than nonviolent ones. Does that hold for climate change? I don't know. And I think it's up to each of us here to determine for ourselves which types of perspectives are acceptable for us in which contexts, right? Which ones uh, we may want to reject. So we're not advocating these tactics. We're opening up the discussion to just show the range of options is more pluralized than you may have thought. And let's at least begin to decolonize our own knowledge within the academy and within research about what might be possible and desirable. And with that, Alexandra, it's back to you and Matt. Thank you very much. And um, yes, um, can we hear your thoughts, Matt? Yeah, can you all hear me all right? Okay, um, thank you so much to Mark. I think Mark really did a lot of the heavy lifting here, pulling this all together. So. And thank you, Alexandra, for moderating this event. Thank you, Benjamin, for having this conversation. Um, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Did not come up with a title as Benjamin did, which was clever. OK, um, I want to start with something that people know, but we don't often think enough about, which is despite everything we've known about climate change for decades, really the world still relies on fossil fuels for about 80% of um, primary energy consumption. In fact, a June 2021 study, um, a report by a Renewable Energy Group just flatly states, since 2009, the global share of fossil fuels and final energy consumption has remained the same. Now, you might ask, how can this be? We've, you've probably heard renewables are getting cheaper and vastly expanding and all as Benjamin was talking, all these policies are in motion. Um, well, the problem is they aren't uh, clean energy really isn't expanding fast enough uh, to keep up with overall energy demand. So that as energy demand goes up, renewables might increase, but the share of fossil fuels remains flat. So um, solving climate change means we really have to replace uh, what this chart conveys, which is um, this fossil fuel energy system, and we have to do it rapidly. So the central point I want to make today is that that is a Herculean uh, feat uh, that's going to require massive large-scale investment, and I would add things like central planning, and um, I, I really like Benjamin's sort of this trio of technology, uh, behavior, and policy. I think it also is going to really require mass working class mobilization and, and social movements to to force these kinds of this massive energy transition that still really hasn't happened. So I actually reviewed this article that Benjamin was referring to to prepare for this and this article by Benjamin and Alexander Dunlop, which offers this review of all these different tactics and strategies rep, rep, sort of linked to this green anarchist perspective and one thing stands out. The overwhelming focus in a lot of this discussion is on sort of building resistance to the power of fossil capital. The article draws, as you heard, from you know everything from civil disobedience to more violent forms of guerrilla warfare. And in the climate movement, we're we're used to this. There's a general focus on movements that would block 
fossil fuel infrastructure. And that aligns a lot with what the climate movement has been up to for quite some time, you know, engaging in these direct action tactics to block pipelines, coal mines, power plants, or lately I've been hearing deflate SUV tires. Some I hear are even talking about blowing up pipelines. And there is a moral urgency and necessity of these kinds of actions. But what I want to suggest is these actions don't really do a ton to, to really address the question of how are we going to transition from this 80% powered fossil fuel powered system and how do we do that rapidly? So to do that, I think climate change, uh, we need kind of a new kind of environmentalism that's not only focused on blocking stuff, um, as important as that is, but one that focuses on the urgent need that we actually have to build a new energy system. We need new clean energy facilities uh, of generation. We need massive new transmission lines. We need new public transportation. We need new green housing stock and all the rest. So it's gonna be the project of building a new world and a new energy system. What I wanna assert first here is that kind of one of the core um, anti-authoritarian and anarchist principles, uh, hold on one sec that is articulated in this article is really um, uh, really ill-equipped for this big Herculean task. And that principle is one of voluntary cooperation, which the article sort of asserts is a core principle of anarchist philosophy, voluntary cooperation, mutual aid, these types of things. So I wanna suggest it's really patently unimaginable that we can embark on this kind of massive global plan of decarbonization by simply hoping that individuals and communities will volunteer to do it. It's actually gonna require, I would suggest, large scale coordination, planning, and even maybe a bit of coercion. That means a left climate politics, really overall, we can't just be about resisting the power of fossil fuel, um, capital. We actually shouldn't shy away from power itself because we need to build a kind of left climate movement that aspires for power. Um, and to me, it's really a question if we're going to transition off that 80% fossil fuel system, it's really a question of, of power over investment, who controls investment in new energy infrastructure. And there's two things we can say about investment recently, whether it be private or public. First, Investment overall has slowed to a trickle in states particularly uh, that have sort of bought into austerity economics and that we can't really afford to do anything. But also capitalists have really been lately sort of sitting on loads of cash and are more happy to funnel their profits into stock buybacks and, you know, speculative derivatives markets than to actually build stuff and invest in stuff. So... And despite all that, really, when we look at a societal wide basis, the only social force that really has the power to shape investment is capital right now. And capital has been equipped with this, their own ideology of volunteer, voluntary cooperation th that does have this um, ideology of free markets and that we can leave the economy to decentralized prices and the individual buyers and sellers volunteering, volunteering to buy and sell things on a market. Capital has convinced us that really we can trust them to deliver this energy transition, even though overall they're not really doing it and they're not really investing in a large scale anyway. So despite that, the Biden administration has come into power in 2021 and just sort of thrown up their hands and said, this is not something government can solve. This is something for the private sector to solve. And I would argue the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act is basically just another iteration of this ideology that we simply can create kind of, as Benjamin said, nudges or market incentives to like tax credits and just hope that investors and consumers will freely choose to make the right climate decisions in a market that's totally free of coercion, that this can all just be done voluntarily and free of any kind of um, coercion. Oops. So we have to ask ourselves, what other social force could actually possess the kind of power to deliver large-scale investment that we need? And the answer should be obvious, I think, to non-anarchists, at least, that it's really got to be the state, <laughs> or more precisely, what Daniel, uh, political economist Daniela Gabor calls what we need is a big green state that's really going to you know, take the reins of this climate crisis and build this new energy system that we 
require. So Andreas Mom also put it in a recent discussion of his concept of ecological Leninism that, quote, it's incredibly difficult to see how anything other than the state than state power could accomplish the transition required, given that it will be necessary to e exert coercive authority against those who want to maintain the status quo. So coercive authority probably sounds pretty bad, but we actually do need it. Um, the state is going to be the only entity that can really um, sort of enforce the legal power to discipline, or as Christian Parenti called, says, euthanize <laughs> fossil capital. And second, states really have this large-scale capacity to coordinate and plan large-scale investment, which is um, really important. And also, any kind of large-scale project of building a new energy system is really going to encounter, especially in the United States, uh, relentless nimbyism, sort of people trying to fight building these new energy infrastructures, whatever they are. And some of that nimbyism is going to be really justified and important, like indigenous communities resisting something like a lithium mine. But a lot of it, I would argue, is going to be a more petty bourgeois politics of defending property rights, of defending property values, private property owners not wanting transmission lines going on their land, uh, or worried about windmills blocking their aesthetic views, or whatever it might be. So only kind of a big green state can kind of coordinate and overcome this kind of scattered nimbyism that would um, kind of emerge from this large-scale project of building. We've really lived under this ideological fog of neoliberalism for so long that we've forgotten that large-scale public investment is even possible. It's worth remembering that when we talk about a Green New Deal, it's because the original New Deal actually did this, right? It, um, it built massive new energy, a massive new energy system. It harnessed what should be considered the public resources of of, of rivers and hydropower to deliver electricity, particularly to the countryside. And it used these popular slogans of electricity for all and then uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, the new uh, the Rural Electrification Administration. You know, the scale of what these entities accomplish is quite astonishing. In 1934, in the United States, only 10% of farms had electricity. By 1950, it was over 90%. So when you think about like, th they basically electrified the entire countryside in the span of about 15 years. This is what we need to, this is the scale of the transition that we need if we're gonna even come close to 1.5 degrees. Oops, okay, so getting near the end. About three years ago, the climate left realized this and tried to build this sort of large, scale program of public investment under the banner of a Green New Deal. But in the wake of, you know, Bernie Sanders' defeat uh, and the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act, it's clear that that kind of vision has faded away. It's not really won the, the day. So if we want to actually win this kind of politics, I think we should think about something that the article by Silvacall and Dunlop barely mentioned, which are the, the workers and the laborers who would build this system and who work in this energy system. So if we want a politics of building, we need to think about who's going to do the building. And on that front, I think we should be encouraged, at least if we're socialists, that there exists this kind of heavily organized um, and unionized block of workers in the building trades. And specifically, my recent book, Climate Changes Class War, argues that really the crucial sector of decarbonization is the electric sector. You got to clean up electricity, then electrify everything, et cetera. Um, these workers are a huge power block in the very system that we need to transform. And But because much of the climate movement has been primarily about blocking stuff like pipelines, it's largely been at odds with the, these workers and these unions who, I think for good livelihood reasons, prioritize their good unionized jobs over this sort of urgent need to phase out fossil fuels. Because of these tensions, much of the left sort of thinks we can build a winning climate politics without these workers that are problematic and, you know, have sometimes really immoral, bad ideas. Um, uh, and that we can just build a kind of movement for a Green New Deal with our sort of natural low carbon allies like teachers and nurses and service workers. Um, but that just seems to me delusional from a basic political perspective. These building trades become are still quite powerful blocks of workers in this very system. And, you know, uh, 
if we're going to build a new system, it's like these are the workers that are going to do it. Um, so, but it's also just completely backward from sort of just basic socialist principles. The workers that do the work are the ones that have the agency and the strategic capacity to transform the world, to change society. They also add, have tremendous skills and knowledge about how these systems actually work, how to build a reliable electrical system. And they have strategic power just by virtue of the fact that if they withdraw their labor, they can create a social crisis, force elites to actually respond to their demands. So in closing, if we're gonna save the planet from a kind of hothouse earth scenario, we need two forces, large scale power, um, oh, sorry, we need two forces of large scale power that are quite inimical to a green anarchist vision of voluntary cooperation, a big green state and the power of industrial unions. Now we on the left um, need to be serious about building that kind of power that can actually take on the fossil fuel capitalist class that's really hell bent on maintaining their investments and profits well into this century. And I don't think green anarchism really has ambition for that level of power that we need to build to stave off planetary catastrophe. And thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. And um, now it's supposed to be my task to kind of um, um, provoke uh, Benjamin and, and, and Matt. And I never realized this would be so difficult because um, I hadn't heard them speak before and I didn't know what they were going to talk about. Um, but I am going to to try and, um, and and put a few thoughts into uh, what I've gathered from from these two um, argumentations. Um, one is that uh, when we talk about transformation, we talk about transformation in terms of understanding the problem so we know where we want to move on from we have some kind of vision to move towards so that we know what the transformation is about and then um and then we have tactics to handle this um and uh and somehow i had the feeling that in in both cases these three were kind of uh uh, we kept moving between these three levels and sometimes we talked about one and, and sometimes the other. But what I gathered from what you were saying was, um, was that probably our understanding of what is wrong is, um, is pretty similar in both cases. So we kind of, we know what's going wrong, wrong. Uh, but later on, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, so, uh, um, so we know what's not working well. We also kind of have, the visions are not quite the same of where we should be, but we, we kind of know, uh, um, we have a few common points. We want ecology to, or ecological thinking to be, um, um, uh, more emphasized. Um, we probably have, you probably have very different ideas on what technology should be like and what role technology uh, should play in, in such, a, such a vision. Uh, and this is important because behind technology, there's always a social vision. So no matter what kind of technology we, we use, there is a strong social vision behind that technology. And... Um, um, so maybe you can, you can talk a little bit about maybe the differences between these visions and whether these social visions behind the technology, uh, would be different. And, um, and yes, and, and, and where the two, uh, streams of thoughts, uh, diverge the most is, is obviously tactics. Like how, how do we get there? Um, and, um. I, I quite like uh, systems view um, and, uh, and in systems view, basically what, what we're saying is that uh, you can't really um, have the emergence of new systems, the emergence of new, new traits. You can't have them 
through controlling a process. You just, you, you just give impulses to such a system and through these impulses, you kind of, you, you kind of almost hope that, that these impulses will turn into like new um, dynamic um, balances and these dynamic balances will come up with new um, systems. And, um, and in both, both of your comments, I had the feeling that, um, that your, your strategies, your tactics are about controlling, controlling this uh, transformation. And I'm not absolutely certain uh, that that's possible. So I wonder if you can respond in terms of, um, of impulses, like what kind of impulse would um, eco-anarchists uh, give to the system and what kind of impulse um, um, socialists would do. And uh, I'm, I'm coming from, a, from an ecological economics and, and degrowth more, more um, um, uh, more precisely, a degrowth background, and what Matt was saying is uh, is obviously something that really provokes me, because uh, um, you're you're talking about large scale investments. You're talking about who is going to build, and my question is, who is going to not build? Like, you know, sooner or later, we have to realize that that the limits are so strong that basically what, what we need is, um, is stop building, whatever. So uh, just this transformation should be about um, uh, respecting these, these boundaries and see how we can not build. And to be honest, in, in, in socialist thinking, this is something that I miss the most this kind of question of, of how to, how not, not to build. Um, so these are, these are my questions um, and my, um, um, yes, and, and my comments to, to what, what I've heard. So um, I pass the floor back to, uh, uh, to Benjamin. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm supposed to rebut this somehow. But uh, I, again, I see a lot more convergence than I think divergence. I think that both criticisms are pretty apt. I think Matt's that my perspective hasn't really focused on labor and what kind of socialist movements might do. And they're certainly not about self-organization, right? A lot of my things are about non-organized, disorganized, or kind of totally independent sets of actions across different spectrums. Um, and Alexandra, I like this notion of a systems approach as well. Um, and you could even say this in a bit more concrete manner, which is how could we align technology, policy, behavior, and direct action together, right? Which has happened before in very big previous actions like the abolition of slavery or very recently COVID because the COVID pandemic is a situation where we did have new vaccines, that's your technology, very aggressive policies, things like quarantines, uh, we all changed our behavior, mask wearing, social distancing, canceling travel. And we did see lots of protests and social movements in civil society to help kind of monitor people. Uh, so I think there's a good example of where we did see all four in the same direction. And if you want a different analogy, I was reading some of the work on feminism and ecofeminism, and Eve Sedgwick, I think, calls this the Christmas effect. One time a year where society in the West gets together and talks about Christmas is a rare moment that the churches, the marketplaces, and the employment institutions are all aligned to say, you're on break, go shop, enjoy Santa Claus. Um, and so it's very rare that our societies come together to see this type of alignment that affects the systems level. And I think that that definitely opens up new opportunities that maybe um, anarchy and socialism and civil disobedience can harmonize rather than disrupt. Matt, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are, I, I thought you would talk longer and now I'm disheveled. <laughs> um, let me try to um, trace out some things, particularly from what Alexandra, those really 
I'm impressed you were able to come up with such coherent thoughts on the fly like that. That was really great. Um, first of all, I think I really liked Alexandra sort of re-politicizing technology in the way she did, because I think Benjamin set it up where it's almost as if these technology behavior and um, policy are kind of the, obviously they're not apolitical, but they're kind of the old hat way of, of thinking about these transitions. And um, and for from a Marxist pers perspective, honestly, like um, technology is is at the, at its core not neutral. It's highly political. It's a it's a it's a tool of class struggle, right? Um, and and therefore, uh, if we want to change, which which are you know technological systems of energy, um, it's we got to think about it in those expressly political. Um, terms of class struggle. And the problem is, under a capitalist society, technologies are only developed if they're profitable for private investors. And clearly, after decades of, of, of politicians and others telling us that we can trust these private investors to deliver us this energy transition, they're not doing it. And a lot of the technological solutions exist, but they're not profitable enough. For investors to invest in and they're not and as long as that's the case we need to build up some kind of social power over technology that can direct technology under different social logics that are not just profitability or market cost effectiveness or whatever it's going to be um i also like um the the focus on systems change because we are we are talking about as this as the slogans in the streets say system change not climate change and i think again um marxists would would ask how do systems change and that that famous quote from the communist manifesto that history of of all societies a history of class struggle and that if if we really see um this ecological crisis in the kind of world historical terms that i think many of us do we need to think about like what kind of class struggle could could force uh, a kind of system change that that could avoid the kind of collapse that I think Mark hinted at at the beginning, um, because that's what we're up against. We have a class of owners and profiteers who are very happy to continue making profits off these investments that are cooking the planet for the rest of us, and we can't stop them. It's going to be not system change, but system collapse, right? Um, uh, you talked about both Benjamin and myself are kind of wanting to control this transformation and that might not be possible. I would just point out that we've been told as a society that we can't control this transformation, that we have to let the market figure it out. And the market is fundamentally something that is classified as apolitical, as this this decentralized natural space that just works out naturally and we can't control it, right? We can't intervene in it. We just have to let it do its thing and it's not doing its thing. So I would, I assert that we actually need a much more ambitious politics that we need to take control of this problem and, 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 and implement large scale coordination planning to, to, to actually build this new energy system. And, and I, I take your point that, uh, to deal with the ecological crisis, we do need to learn how not to build and how to actually let non-human nature flourish um, in all sorts of ways. But another Marxist principle is we have to face the world as it is and the material conditions that confront us. And we have built a world that's at least in the parts that um, are linked, uh, you know, linked into these energy networks that allow something like 240 people now to talk together or be on this Zoom meeting together. We've created these large-scale uh, energy systems that 80% um, run on fossil fuels. And if you think we we can just sort of tear it all down and then just retreat back to a pre-fossil fuel world, it's just not going to be possible, or at least we're not going to be able to inspire and and really build a mass popular movement if that's our politics that we're just going to tear it all down we have to actually have a politics that 
convinces people that we can build uh, an energy system that can deliver masses of people from things like energy poverty, can actually deliver vital electricity to um, people, not just in the global north, but there's about 800 million people on the planet that have no electricity. There's about 3.1 billion people that consume less electricity than your refrigerator does every year. So I, I'm more in the kind of socialist camp that thinks this kind of energy infrastructure should be like a human right and that we need to learn ways to build it and give it to, to everyone, and but also plan those systems so that they don't destroy the ecological conditions of all of us and, and all that stuff. So some people in the kind of Green New Deal orbit have talked about, I'm not sure I like this concept, but a last stimulus, that we actually need this last kind of building process of building this kind of gr green energy sustainable world and 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 then um, once we've kind of taken care of everyone's material needs, we can kind of figure out things uh, afterwards and make those difficult social political questions about what actually do we need to build and what do we not need to build and and actually make that a political discussion as opposed to well the market decides what is built or not built and if it's profitable it gets built right we need to intervene on on that and say we want to take control over those questions over what is built okay i'll stop there if you both had to name maybe three things where you think the two uh, uh the two approaches um can have a kind of synthesis or, or can can really build a future together um what what would they be and uh where do you think are the and just name one of these so three positive ones and one where you think these approaches will never really um never really meet in the middle so alexandra to answer that last bit just read the chat because there have been so many chats going back and forth about like different degrees of anarchism, different positionality of people, whether Matt and I are too still libertarian or still on the liberalist side and we're promoting techno change from the top down. So I think this is this is the challenge. It's that, you know, these schools of thought are so broad and diverse. They include multiple perspectives, many of which can even, you know, contradict each other. So they differ metaphysically, epistemically, um, which makes it very difficult, you know. Uh, to actually harmonize action. And I think fundamentally, there's a tension between incremental and transformative change. Incremental changes would be working within the system to change it. And for lack of a better word, transformative changes would be revolutionary. They would overthrow the system. Um, and there's been so much consolidation of wealth, and there's been so much power already concentrated in the elite, that's very hard to do. And it would be almost impossible to do without violence. Um, I still remember Van, Van Clausewitz used to say that the definition of a state is whoever has a monopoly on violence. And I think that the elites now have a monopoly on violence as well as the means of production, as well as intellectual capital and resources, which is why people like Thomas Piketty say that our current society is the most unequal ever. We have more inequality now than we had during feudal times or the times of monarchs and kings and queens. Uh, so it's very hard to overthrow that system. And even if everyone on this call were to just start rejecting it, that would make very little change to the global capitalist economy. Where do I see though common leverage points? I think in some of these tactics, I do think because many of us on this call seem to be scholars and researchers, these practices of witnessing, watching, delegitimization are very good for researchers because they mean we can all expose oppression, expose hypocrisy, expose the truth as we see it behind particular actions that are very nefarious and have very inequitable outcomes. That's probably easy to do. I also believe strongly in organized protests, right? And so Fridays for the Future, Extinction Rebellion, all of these, these are also situations to come together. Are they effective? That's a debate, but at least they do come together and they have started to shift, you know, the same day that we had the huge Fridays for the Future March last year, it did shape Amazon and Google and other companies making announcements about decarbonization. 
Were they additional or not? Was it greenwashing or not? Perhaps, but at least it's something. I can't say that I've had that effect with my research. So people like Greta Thunberg have had far more effect than me. And I think finally, um, I think that if you live here in London like I do, there are situations of effectiveness where you have groups like Insulate Britain that are doing direct action techniques like blocking the highways. And it irritates the heck out of people because of traffic jams. So it's kind of like, I mean, and granted, it hasn't yet changed energy efficiency policy. Well, the government just changed this week. Um, but I think they're, they're, they seem to be effective. Every time they do it, they would be in the press. Every time they did it, people mentioned Grenfell Tower and other things. Every time they did it, there were mass arrests and people willing to go to jail. So I think this kind of area of fighting the system by causing pressure points to collapse and being willing to risk going to jail uh, are a third area that seems to be pretty effective. And even climate scientists like Jim Hansen and Gus Speth have also been arrested for protesting in front of things like coal-fired power plants. That's all I got. Matt? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of overlap in the, the contribution by Benjamin and Alexander, particularly on what I'm calling for is we need a mass movement and mass social power. And I think anytime you see mass movements emerge, it has these elements that the article goes through, particularly direct action um, and civil disobedience. I've, um, you know, I recently watched the six part doc documentary on the um, civil rights movement, Eyes on the Prize. And, you know, those were exactly what Benjamin was just talking about, people putting their bodies on the line and and creating this direct action tactics that really um, shut things down and forced larger society to kind of react. And I think it's also worth mentioning that the whole excitement around a Green New Deal emerged from a sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office in 2018 by the Sunrise Movement. And that is what catalyzed the whole sort of explosion of Green New Deal discussions. I would add, you know, the article from Benjamin and Alexander has a short section on strikes. I would I would elevate the the strategic power of labor strikes. And you look, you, you, probably the mo the most another massive transformative era of change in our history is the 1930s. And if you look at a a graph of the number of labor strikes in in, in the 1930s, you see an explosion in 1934. And then all, lo and behold, some of the most progressive legislation in our history was passed a year later in 1935. So labor strikes have have power that other strikes don't. I have a, so much respect for Greta Thunberg and the, and the students who are striking, but they don't have the same strategic capacity to shut down whole school systems like the teachers do. And if we go back four years to West Virginia, where teachers were able to build uh, the capacity to shut down entire school districts, entire school systems with the families and parents and communities on their side because they built up solidarity. They were able to win their demands within a couple weeks of these school strikes by shutting down vital systems of social reproduction, forcing a red state, a Republican state to just bend over to their demands. You know, they could have tried to pass those laws by lobbying, by getting the right people elected. But they went on strike and they won within a couple of weeks because of the strategic power of labor and labor strikes in particular. And I do think there's there needs to be a, a more strategic discussion about how we use these tactics to, to win, right? Because I think um, sometimes in the environmentalist movement, there's this kind of moralistic thing that we just need to you know, shut stuff down and put our bodies in the middle of things and, and block stuff and all that stuff. But as we've seen, I think Benjamin was mentioning, um, there's been a lot of actions by, you know, Extinction Rebellion or others that have ha led to huge popular backlashes against these movements and against these ideas that uh, we need rapid climate action because they did do something like disrupt everyday workers going to their job or dis or block um, you know, a public transit train or so you have to be strategic about disruption like the civil rights movement was and really think clearly about how can how can this kind of disruption not lead to popular backlash, but lead to popular sympathy and popular uh, solidarity where people are, are on the side of the disruption on a mass level, because that's the key to kind of building 
taking disruption and, and translating it to mass movements. I'll stop there. Thank you. And um, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not that good at multitasking, so I, I haven't been able to read all the chat lines, especially that I'm still admitting people uh, um, <laughs> into this discussion uh, while listening to you two. Um, but I have found a few questions that I, I, I quite like and I'd like to um, um, voice. Um, Sarah was asking, how can we measure at the urban level whether the state or local authority are controlling how the private market is implementing the transition? Are there any dimensions indicators? Very good question. So um, I'll give you an unsatisfactory answer. At a high level, the World Bank, not known for being a bastion of independent non-liberal data does have the worldwide governance indicators and that is a composite of other indicators so they're looking at like rule of law freedom of speech government stability so it gets into which countries at least and it does map on roughly to a fair list of like which countries are more democratic and which aren't which have different dimensions of democracy like which control the press which have freedom of expression which have uh good norms of governance within all the assumptions that go that go into that um the other way of looking at it wouldn't be at the level of municipalities, but there's been a really big push in the past 30 years for the liberalization and market restructuring of energy, water, and telecoms. So this isn't done state by state, it's done more company by company or territory by territory. But in the United States, you have a whole set of markets that are not restructured, they're monopoly markets. So they're functioning as if energy is not a commodity and it's priced very reasonably and companies are limited in the profits they can make. There's usually a guaranteed statutory rate of return, but it's low. It's like 2% or 3%. So they're regulated markets. And there are also markets in the US that are restructured and liberalized. So they operate as if energy is a commodity, like Texas and Houston, and you could choose from hundreds of suppliers. And so that's at least getting at, you could start to get into which types of markets are constrained and view energy as a right, and which types of markets are open to competition and view energy as a commodity. Um, that could at least be a partial way into this question of like which locations are more or less equitable or just. Matt? Yeah, I could, um, one thing that I think a lot of socialists have, have gone on to is, is the idea of public power in general, public electricity. And, and that, I think it shouldn't be confused for a um, like a, um, a, fi a fix, like a total solution that if you just take public ownership of electricity, then it will magically go in the direction we want. All that I think it does is create a system that has a little more ability of the public and, and the people to shape it through democratic means rather than a private electricity system is going to be again about serving their shareholders and about making profits and they can as benjamin point out you can have these private investor owned utilities that are um heavily regulated and really have strict rules about pricing and profits but they're still their ultimate goal is to deliver to shareholders i live in a territory uh that's uh run by a distribution utility called national grid which is based in the UK actually, <laughs> it's, a, it's a foreign company and uh, their CEO makes something like close to, if I recall, $6 million a year. And so it's just a different logic. When you have a public power entity, you can actually have more democratic potential to shift it in the ways we want. Um, but as Benjamin was pointing out, like there's many different scales of public electricity. You have a lot of municipal public power entities, which are really usually, not always, but usually really only dealing with the distribution of electricity and the wires that go to our homes and delivering those in a public uh, public mission. But you also have, um, you know, state level public power agencies like in Nebraska or where I live in New York state, there's something called the New York Power Authority that FDR set up when he was governor that really took state level control over hydro and built out a lot of generation and now owns also a lot of transmission. 
And then you have something like the federal TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority. It's owned by the federal government. It's a national scale thing. Um, and I actually think um, if we're worried about climate change, we actually need to be a little focused that the real problem is how we generate electricity, whether it be from fossil fuels or other sources. So we have to start thinking about um, publicly owned generation, public public uh, own ownership of the means of production, the means of electricity production. And that that isn't always the case for public power campaigns, because a lot of times people are talking about taking over their municipal distribution grid and it has very little to do with generation and production. So, um, but anyway, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that there's many different scales of public ownership and public intervention that we need to start thinking about stacking them and and in and, and various ways. Um, if I could just add something on top of this, agreeing with Matt, um, there are two colleagues of mine, uh, Gerald and Theo Oppenheim, who even wrote a book about the regulatory compact. And this is a neat book because it's like we often think of the state as evil, but it turns out there are some, not all, there are some situations where state regulations are actually very equitable and just. And in the US, there are a lot of public utility commissions that operate under authority and jurisdiction where they can regulate, they can intervene, and they can do emergency protections and promote equity. I'll put a link into the book, but at least it's a bit hopeful because it's an example of where you're regulating for the public good and you're trying to constrain the state and utilities and the corporations from doing too much. Um, so I'll put a link into the chat. It's a good book worth reading, although it's a bit out of date. Thank you. And um, here's another question from uh, Roberto. Um, don't we need a global political system that allows for multiple views that achieve the same end, ecological sustainability at a domestic level? Maybe I Matt can, can start. Yeah, I can start this time. Um, I think we do, right? And we're kind of stuck with this Westphalian uh, system of national state sovereignty where it becomes, as we know, painfully difficult to, to achieve global cooperation on what is in fact a planetary and global crisis and we need that coordination um so i would you know people on the call might be familiar with uh the book climate leviathan which tries to think like are we are we actually moving towards something that you could call planetary sovereignty is there going to have to be a kind of um uh, form of planetary uh sovereignty because a, a thousand years ago, many people would find this national state sovereignty system really weird because governance was not always between this sort of very fixed territorial states that we have, this very specific political geography that we've had for the last, let's say, 400 plus years. Um, so history changes. Could we imagine a global form of sovereignty that could be democratic and, and even more just? that could try to rectify some of these entrenched uh, forms of inequalities across the world and and um, um, and so forth. But I would, uh, sort of my shtick, but I would, I would just hearken us back to some very basic principles of Marxism and socialism, which is internationalism, and that the goal of a global working class socialist movement was always about, about emancipating the working class on a planetary level. It was about human emancipation and building up a global socialist revolution so that actually we could start to coordinate as a species. Um, what does what do we actually need for human uh, flourishing? And, and I think um, if we think about that as both a, a project of, of human emancipation to take control from capitalist class over production and, and put it in the hands of the producers and the majority of society, then we can also say, yeah, we want to liberate humans. We want to give everyone free time and enough enough of their basic existence covered. But if we were able to sub, sub, subject global production to democratic questions, we can extend those questions to be about eco ecological systems and, and how can we preserve more land for non-humans and how can we obviously stabilize the climate and all these kinds of things that we have no real control over in a capitalist system we have to extend democratic control over if we kind of think about this kind of global uh, working class movement. 
I can just add very briefly because I thought Matt's answer was quite good. We're, we're agreeing more than we're disagreeing, but um, I also think that there's a lot to be said for a maximum wage. So this is also a fundamental reform that you can make to the economic system that could generate excess revenue back into things like public goods. And this is an idea that's been around for thousands of years. Even the Greeks talked about a maximum wage. And it's been proposed in the US. Roosevelt actually proposed one. Uh, and they proposed it again around the time of the Great Depression because it equalizes wages. Uh, um, and you could even set it so that you can still make $150,000 a year. It's just you don't have the mega millionaires and the billionaires. Um, similarly, there are forms of economic organization that aren't so exploitative, like cooperatives. There are some very good, like the Mondragon organization in Spain, right, where they pay people equal wages. The top person can't make more than the bottom person, right, by more than maybe one or two times. Um, and they reinvest back into the community and back into the company rather than into profits and growth. And they constrain themselves so they don't grow too much. And there are new forms of economic um, activity like low profit limited liability corporations or B corporations, that's for benefit corporations, or community interest companies that blend social entrepreneurship with the goals of profit. And they often constrain profit. Uh, so it's, you know, we can also think about fundamentally, it doesn't have to be investor owned utilities, it could be cooperatives and community interest companies that have fundamentally different visions about what a company is. Thank you. And um, can I just bring in one perspective, actually my perspective this time. Uh, um, I'm, I am from Hungary and actually um, I am of the age where in, in 1989 I was actually in front of the parliament building when they, um, um, they uh, declared the republic. And, um, and it, it, it was a huge thing for us. And, and we thought, yeah, well, something fantastic is, is going on. And now, uh, 30 years later, I'm, I'm here listening to you. And, and also, when I, when I talk about, about ecological economics in, um, or degrowth in, uh, in Hungary, I al always have, have this feeling that, you know, people have this inherent dislike of anything that's to do with the state um, kind of making people align themselves to any program. And, and this, this is actually something that Matt, Matt was, was, um, was kind of suggesting. So uh, my, my question is, and, and, and also what I, I wanted to mention is, is that we have been through socialism and I am of the opinion of, of, of many, many scholars to believe that what, what we actually experienced was not socialism, it was actually uh, state capitalism, because, uh, um, because uh, workers still did not enjoy the fruits of their labor, they still didn't have control over, uh, um, over their... their uh, um, uh, tools of production. So uh, uh, the only difference was it, it was in, in, the, in the hand of the state rather than the hand of, of, uh, of private owners. So, um, so what, what, what would you say? What are the, I'm not, I'm not saying guarantees, but what are the, the kind of um, the novel ideas that might, um, might prevent us from from doing exactly the same than what, what had happened before in, in like a large chunk of the world. Well, Alexander, I think it's, it's even worse in the other direction where we're heading towards populism and post-truth politics that make demagogues and people that can manipulate information even more powerful. And so it's actually gotten worse. Like in the 90s, 1989, there wasn't Facebook yet or Twitter. And the ability to manipulate, you know, deep fakes and put up fake videos and all this was very, very nascent. And now we've given the kind of technical elite a lot of power over manipulating things. And it makes it very hard to determine fact and fiction and truth from falsehood. And it apparently makes it very easy to manipulate publics. I still don't think Brexit was a very rational choice. And yet we're going ahead with it. Um, and I'm very disturbed by Trump potentially reemerging. Um, in the next presidential election to say nothing of people like Bolsonaro and others in Brazil, right, and the rise of these leaders. And so I think that I, I don't think it's so easy as we found the solution. I think we're backsliding and we're actually losing many of the gains. Hungary's a, Hungary and Ukraine 
are two great cases in point. I almost think a Hungary in 1990 and a Ukraine in 1990 are far, far better than the Hungary and Ukraine of 2022 with the current leaders that they have. Um, and you see countries like China eliminating term limits for their leader, Russia eliminating term limits for Putin. Um, it's heading in an anti-democratic way. Yeah, it's, it's not always helpful to be the socialist that says, but how they did it in history, that's not the real socialism. That's not the right socialism. Um, but, you know, my feeling is that at least Marxism and Marx himself was a radical Democrat. He believed, he, you know, some have tried to actually situate him in the tradition of republicanism, which is an, an which is actually an anti-domination politics. I'm not sure if it's what you would call anti-authoritarian, but it's an anti-domination politics, which is ultimately about freedom. And, and Marx wanted us to have freedom over not just speech and religion and civil rights, but actually have freedom over our economic lives. And that his vision of, of socialism or communism as what he called associated producers or associated production was that the vast majority of society, the people that do the work in production should be collectively determining what that looks like and should have democratic control over it. Now you look at the exact, the, the actual history of state socialism and it's, as you said, Alexander, it's not that at all. There's um, not much democratic um, power over production. The workers don't, didn't end up having a lot of power over production. And that was the vision at least. And I, I, th I think, you know, um, if we look at world history as one that is is moving towards uh, more or less democracy, and Benjamin pointed out the very alarming trends of less democracy lately, but if, we're, if, we, if we can just, just imagine a world in which democracy was extended to the economic realm, um, that's what we mean by socialism. Um, but I would say uh, there... There are some horrible things about the old socialist systems, but there are some good things too. I'm, I'm thinking of a historian named Kristen Godsey who talked about how when you did actually provide economic rights for people, and we, in the United States, we like to talk about our Bill of Rights, which is like the freedom of speech and all this stuff, but we don't, we, we also don't have the right to healthcare. <laughs> we don't have the right to food. And so Kristen Godsey's work has shown, you know, actually delivering economic rights um, was actually quite empowering for women in socialist states. She wrote a whole book about this. And, and, um, and also she looks at polling in the former Soviet bloc and finds that lots of people in, this, in these areas look back quite fondly of the period of state socialism where they, because precisely because they just had their basic economic uh, things taken care of, which of course under shock therapy and neoliberal uh, fast transition to capitalism was sort of taken away. And even in China, you know, they talked about the iron rice bowl where everyone sort of had guaranteed uh, employment and, and subsistence. Uh, that was taken away with the reforms of 1978. So um, guaranteed economic subsistence is something we should build on, but that's not also necessarily associated producers and democracy, right? That's just making sure people are taken care of. But I think Marx's larger vision is really about people not only getting what they need, but actually having the capacity to govern the world and the economic systems that, that we rely on. It could begin with the power of imagination. So I'm quite a fan of J.K. Gibson Graham, who are feminist political ecologists. And they often say, you know, it's often easier to imagine like nuclear war than it is the end of capitalism. You know, that capitalism has so much power and it's actually members of the left or anarchists who embow it with the most power because we think we can't fight it. It's so structural. It's constraining everything that we do. And maybe it's just beginning to imagine what a different world might look like and how we would organize relations differently, whether it's direct democracy or it's cooperatives or it's constraints on growth. Um, we also often forget that the current world order is not that old. Even the Treaty of Westphalia, we're talking, what, 400 years ago? And so all that we see, this world of nation states and sovereignty and trade and national economies and markets and currency is not old. Uh, and so it is very easy to envision a new world order that operates on different principles. 
Thank you. I, I think we have um, one thing um, in common, um, and that's um, that we need more democracy. No matter what approach will reign, we, we, we do need more demo democracy. And, um, and probably one more thing I'd add is, is just distribution. Um, and um, I would like to ask you to write questions in the chat that you would like to ask. Uh, or you would like me to ask, uh, because uh, there's been incredibly good uh, sharing of resources and ideas um, uh, in the chat. Um, and, um, uh, and it's very difficult for me to see whether questions are actually um, hidden in there. Uh, but one thing, one thing before we have these questions coming in, um, what I'd like to ask you, Benjamin and, and Matt, is to, to kind of tell me why your approach is better suited for degrowth. So I don't think that I have in a single approach, nor is it by any means a panacea or a blueprint for degrowth. I think what we wanted to do in that article with Alex was open up the discussion space knowing full well that you know neither of us are actually subscribing to all of the views that we put forth. And by the way, we welcome further criticism. Like this was meant to be a starting point, not an end point. So there are many different shades of anarchism. There's many different types of the state, the green state, the neoliberal state, et cetera. So we are open to further submissions. And in fact, Mark McAfee's Power of 10 was in a way a critique and an expansion of our earlier work. We want this to be built upon because I think all that I want to do is pluralize and decolonize the solution space. Let's open it up to think about what options can perpetuate degrowth versus growth, ecological liberation versus domination, et cetera. So I think that my whole point is there is no single frame. There is no single solution. There are just different perspectives, many of which have different types of value. But I believe that. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Um... I actually have been thinking lately that this this focus that degrowth has on you know we need a planned reduction of material throughput actually isn't necessarily democratic <laughs> to make that claim right um it is I actually was listening I don't know if you all saw there was a debate with Jason Hickel and this other green growth guy I forget his name but he defined degrowth in that debate as a democratic plan reduction. But actually, if it's democratic, we have to decide what is gonna be reduced or not and what will be expanded and what will be grown and what will not. And, and I don't think it's necessarily helpful to say from the start that there must be this reduction or there must be this de degrowth. The goal, as I've been trying to say over and over again, is to, to, to obtain more social power over the, this, these decisions so we can define, decide for ourselves how much do we need to, to be free and live flourishing lives, and how much do we also need to um, maintain ecological systems of flourishing for other species and other life on the planet. And that needs to be worked out, and it's gonna, it would be quite messy democratically to work that out um and saying de facto or a priori that it's going to be this amount of energy everyone gets or this amount of, of of reduction i think is not not particularly democratic we have to decide collectively and what all we want is to build the power to be even have a chance to make those collective decisions because right now the decisions are not made collectively they're made privately by a very narrow set of of an investor class that gets to decide for the rest of us and that's the real problem thank you although i i would argue that degrowth is is not necessarily on 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 planned reduction it's on on actually removing the growth imperative from the system itself so um just uh degrowing having reduction as as the sole aim is is just as senseless as having the sole aim of growing 
So <laughs> that's, I think that's the, the idea. Um, we have a few uh, uh, questions. Uh, Devparna asked, where do you see green anarchist communities appearing and where do you see eco-socialist state emerging? So basically, if you can, if you can, you, you can see regionally where they might occur or emerge. So I, very quickly, and I want to, I'll pass this over to Matt, but there's a good literature on varieties of capitalism. This was a comment also earlier about capitalist states and how some are hybrid entities, the different things. And there are different types of, of capitalism. And there are also very different types of like eco-socialist states. And so that might be a starting point to look at which varieties have kind of in equilibrium more towards environmental protection. I know the usual suspects are countries like Costa Rica, right, that have very good laws that protect and recognize the right to nature and that also have tried to promote kind of, you know, more ecologically aware communities. Um, you also have different, you know, regimes that do eco homes and things like that. But I don't think I can name off the top of my head like the state other than maybe Bhutan that is like an eco anarchist state. Um, but I think the varieties of capitalism literature may help point the way towards that. But Matt and Alexandra may know more. Um, I wouldn't say you can see it much in the United States right now, so that's a bummer. It's not in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, but I actually think you got to, I mean, you can look in various spots around the world, but you got to look at Latin America right now, where the left is resurgent after um, the pink tide or whatever, and then it kind of went to the right for a while, and you see this resurgent left all across Latin America. I wish I, you know, um, there were elements of the Chilean constitution that I think many eco-socialists would be super excited about, like actually putting in writing the rights to nature, actually um, giving uh, uh, what is called a plurinational um, sovereignty to indigenous peoples. Unfortunately, as you saw, that constitution failed in the vote. So, but um, there's other examples to look at. Uh, I don't know if Everyone heard, but recently the leftist president of Mexico nationalized the lithium uh, mines in his state. And that to me, um, there's a lot of discussion in kind of discussions of the energy transition where global North people are gonna just move to electric cars and it's gonna create all these burdens on the global South. One way to, to make sure that doesn't happen is to assert more social power over those those mining regimes um, and to do so with uh, you know goals that will actually benefit the people of Mexico as opposed to just simply the corporations that do the extraction and the populations who consume the lithium in their cars. Um, I'll also point out that AMLO or um, in, in Mexico has been a fervent defender of legacies of public ownership in his energy system um, and trying to really build up, uh, build back up the public sector energy system in Mexico after a, a decade or so of, of pretty neo, like hostile neoliberal privatization. And it's kind of interesting because right now the pretty much, especially in the United States and North America, the renewable energy industry is heavily private, right? It's owned by Wall Street and it's and it's it's very like pro deregulation of markets because it allows them to get a foothold in these generation markets. So AMLO has actually been about taking public control over the energy against these kind of Western or not Western, but uh, often US based renewable energy developers. And so the economist kind of is calling him a climate denier and because he's going against these these free market renewables but he what he's actually trying to do is actually again take public control over mexico's energy future and and plan it in a way that could be beneficial to to uh, the people of mexico as opposed to the investors who want to just build these systems and extract minerals and profits for their own benefits so uh i think yeah right now there's a lot going on you know the first leftist president in Colombia's history. And, and I know he was inspired by a lot of eco-socialist and feminist movements in, um, in Colombia. So uh, there's a lot to, to learn from and think about 
that's happening right now, I would say. Thank you. And um, here's another question from Gareth. Is there a role for emotion as a mobilizing strategy for mass action on climate change and democratic eco-politics? Ben mentioned the irra irrationality of Brexit and new populism, but is rationality all we need? Well, I think there's been very recent work done on different motivational values that are underlying our decisions, some of which are biospheric, some are altruistic, some are very hedonistic. And I think rationality plays very well with certain types of people and certain types of values, but it isn't the only lever that we can use. There are other people who are motivated by ethics and obligations and duty and other things like that. So I think that logic and rationality are necessary but insufficient by themselves. There have been talks about entirely new forms of ethics, environmental ethics, the rights of nature, anti-racist, feminist, indigenous perspectives that give you a very different take on appropriate action. You could even replace the notion of rights, which we have in the US with responsibilities, which is a very, very different take on our duty to preserve the, the biosphere or to protect future generations. Um, so I think that I like rationality, that I'm a rational person. I think that we also should explore different ways of ethics and emotions and other ways of harnessing change. Thank you. Matt? Yeah, um, I, I'm a fan of rationality too. And I think on, on one sense, um, one, one thing I think I would bring caution to in this sort of full-on anti-authoritarian perspective is that particularly electricity systems are extremely complex <laughs> and they require a, 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 an engineering system where you're always balancing supply with demand on the grid and that kind of large-scale coordination requires a lot of rational planning and expertise and engineering know-how and that that's going to have to be a part of of this decarbonization uh project but in terms of mass movements and social change throughout history i think there's always emotion and inspiration and mobilization that is so key to everything that can happen. Um, again, I just watched this documentary series on the civil rights movement. And I think Benjamin and Alexander's article brings up the Montgomery bus boycott as one of their tactics. And that boycott, when you watch this documentary was just sort of an incredible, not just um, achievement, but also just daily grind of people because they're boycotting the box bus, they would walk um, to their workplaces every day and walk together and this and sing songs together. And and more and the most sort of incredible thing about it that I saw was that every night they would have a rally or not a rally or or sort of a mass meeting in the local churches in Montgomery and other parts of where the boycott had spread. And they showed footage of these rallies and they're just filled with emotion. You know, people are singing. There's obviously Martin Luther King is a reverend and he's speaking in these just, you know, like incredible, um, inspiring kind of messages of freedom and justice. And that, and you can see in the crowds just people crying and utter emotion. And 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 so you 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 realize that um we're gonna need a, a dialectical relationship with rationality and um emotion if we're gonna sort of really build the kind of power and social movements that can actually change the world, so. Thank you, and uh, one more question. Uh, another important power block for green politics is indigenous movements. Can they be usefully combined with worker movements in a larger block? Are their goals and tactics reconcilable? This was Cameron who asked this question. I think indigenous movements are really important, but they've often been co-opted. You know, the old saying, dance with the devil, the devil changes you. And I think, you know, blending them in with other movements tends to only subjugate them further. I mean, this is one of the most marginalized communities there is, right? We have oppressed indigenous peoples in almost every culture, often to the point of genocide, to the point where they're all precarious. So at what point we now want to mainstream them into movements that, you know, they can partner with, you know, youth, the unions or I don't know. 
But that said, they certainly have an important voice and they certainly deserve recognition. Um, so I think that they need heard. I'm just not sure if combining them into other movements is the way to do it. But it's a very good question. I, th I think um, ultimately, if your goal is democratizing production, I think part of a lot of indigenous resistance movements are just primarily because the communities in which extraction takes place, there's so little democratic input on the part of those people whose lands and resources and and life ways are being destroyed by the by this kind of extraction. And so that ultimately a lot of these movements are calling for a rejection of that production, but but sometimes they're actually calling for, I, I'm thinking of a documentary I show on resistance movements in Nigeria against oil development, and they're actually calling for commons, a commons-based control over the extraction itself. So that's, again, just arguing for democratic power over these decisions that um, get made. Um, and I think a lot of people would probably see not very much overlap between this idea of a big green state and indigenous politics. But in terms of uh, left power and building up public power to kind of generate massive investments and changes to a society, I think we can look at Bolivia in the case of Evo Morales, who is an indigenous leader. And I think uh, in in my circles in academia, there is a lot of attention to the indigenous resistance to the extractivism that happened under under Evo and under Morales. But there was also, um, I think, undoubtedly, huge popular mass support for for Evo and the party, uh, the movement towards socialism party of of Evo Morales amongst indigenous the sort of indigenous masses of Bolivia. And that that is a I think a different form of indigenous mass politics. You know, in academia, it's almost always like we're looking at local communities that are resisting and fighting, but we don't often think about mass politics and and and, and politics of building state power to actually deliver things for a, a larger society. And I think Evo Morales can teach us a lot, or not him, but the movement, the party. Moss and the 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 kind of larger movement that that represented warts and all I realized that it was not perfect and it kind of um had a lot of issues that we want to discuss but it also you know massively eradicated poverty and um did kind of take public ownership over various energy resources in various ways thank you very much and um I think that's it for for the questions, and I, I think our our time is um, uh, our time is up, and it, it's been really great uh, um, listening to you. And I'm going to quote Christopher in um, uh, in kind of wrapping up. He wrote, "Friends, grateful to have the opportunity to sit in and hear what you've been thinking and doing. Many valuable links and resources in the chat, and fascinating insights into these challenges." And I think that's true. It's incredible what's been ongoing in the chat. Um, really, I think I think that's uh, that's a research on its own. <laughs> what you can collect in uh, uh, in a hundred minutes. So um, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for for being so um, uh, um, so active. And. Um, I'm just going to pass the word to, to Benjamin and Matt if you want to have um, a few sentences just to wrap up. Thanks, Alexander. I was just putting my email in the chat that people can follow through with me directly. And I just also think it was a great discussion and I really appreciate the respect people showed for each other. We were anticipating potential screaming and yelling, none of which happened, no fires were created or Molotov cocktails thrown. So. Um, well done there, but also in, in seriousness, I think tolerance and respect are very good principles to operate on. And I like that we've been able to discuss about a dozen or more different views, all with respect for each other. Yeah, I'll echo that. I was trying to find the clapping emoji to thank thank everyone for, I can't seem to find it. But thank you again to Mark for organizing and Alexandra for doing a great job moderating the discussion. I really enjoyed it. and. 
I put my email there in the chat. Please follow up if you have other thoughts. And um, thanks so much. See you around. And thanks to Mark McCaffrey and Jean Boucher for helping actually organize this. This was kind of their idea. So the silent but very important and benevolent people behind the scenes. <laughs> Thank you, Mark and, and Jean. Thank you all. And um, hopefully we can have other discussions like this in the future. And listen to Economics for Rebels. <laughs>